Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. This is Steve Holzer with BIM Object. I'm joined by my colleague and uh, our BIMScript Global Trainer, Lawrence Lamb. Lawrence, are you are you Hello. with us this morning? Yep, I'm here. Yep, right here. So, great, great. We got uh, a lot of folks filing in. So while we wait for everybody to get in and take a seat, uh, and everybody move to the front of the room, move to the front of the room. We got, we have. Uh, uh, a very large list of uh, registrations. This has been one of our most popular uh, webinars. So uh, we got uh, quite a few folks that uh, have intended on joining us. So for a, a minute there, uh, give you a little bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about today. I'm gonna start it off with, um, since we have such a wide audience and, and probably a fairly big array of uh, folks in the building industry uh, in, in what you each do, I'm going to start off with a quick poll just to get an idea of the audience. Um, I'll go ahead and, and, and launch that poll. Um, and, and while that's up and running, as soon as it does launch, there you go. Uh, just let us know, uh, you know what, what, what your role is in the industry. Um, we're broadcasting from uh, the broadcast capital of the world, um, our BIM object offices in uh, Burbank, California, looking out over Warner Brothers Studios. It's a beautiful day in L.A. I hope it's great wherever you are. Uh, good, nice. We're filling in well here on the poll. I want to thank everybody for for participating in that poll. It's really a, a big help to be able to understand, you know, what what your role is and and how we can best uh, you know give you the information that you're needing. Um, and then at the end, we'll also have a, a, a short survey. And really, the survey is more of a, a query. We're wanting to know what you folks see as information you need in, in not just BIM script, but uh, you know the digital built environment. Uh, what kind of questions do you have? What do you see as challenges? What do you see as opportunities that, that we can help uh, get the word out on? So uh, anyway, so it looks like we've got about uh, two thirds are architects and designers. And then, uh, wow, this is, this is great. Uh, we've got a, a, a decent percentage of building product manufacturers and the construction trade assembly. We're seeing this uh, much, much more uh, often uh, when it comes to uh, the, the digital content piece of the world. So uh, that's great. So uh, let me go back to, uh, I'll get my, my screen back and uh, I'm gonna close this poll. I'll bring back my, So uh, we'll give it just another few seconds here. We, you know, still a few people coming in. Really glad to see. You never know if everybody's clock is exactly synchronized all over the world here. Although with technology, we're we're much more closely aligned, I think, than uh, than we were in days prior. So today's talk is is about manufacturer specific objects. Why are they important? You know, why? Uh, what's this change? Why do we need manufacturer specific content? Why can't we just have you know, just uh, uh, generics. Well, why can't we just have placeholders? Why can't we have uh, the, these items? But today, during our discussion, ask any questions you have. Uh, I got a graphic there. Over on the right-hand side, there's a, a little question box. Um, during my part of the presentation, Lawrence will be uh, monitoring that and making sure that we're able to timely answer those. Any questions that we don't get to, or, or even if they're outside of today's discussion, go ahead and, and leave us the questions. We'll be responding to those after the, the webinar is over and we'll, we'll uh, get those to you directly and uh, look forward to, to uh, working together and understanding the industry a little deeper. Uh, this is also being recorded. Uh, that way it's, it's available for, for you uh, as an attendee. In a couple of days, you'll get a link to the recording uh, if you want to rerun it again or share it with colleagues, as well as anyone that registered that was unable to actually connect and, and be online for the, the time that we're together here. Uh, they will also receive uh, that, that same link. So don't be afraid to, to share that around, to share it with other colleagues that you think might have uh, be helped out by it. So this is all about digital tools. Uh, many industries, and I'm sure you've seen all of the charts and bells and whistles on uh, the building industry being one of the, let's call it um, more, um, uh, conservative in adopting these tools and tool sets for our product, which is 
creating facilities, managing facilities, building facilities, designing facilities, uh, all the way through. Digitalization lets us build it twice, build it right, is, is one of the concepts we use here at, at BIM Object. Uh, in other words, we're intending on, with, our, with the building product manufacturer's content, given uh, a set of Legos. Uh, the bottom line is, when it, when it goes to construction, in, in the old days, we were all kind of working in silos, the design team, kind of separate from the um, engineering team, which those are even more separate from the construction team, from the procurement team, from the trades. Uh, so with, with digital tools, we're all allowed to embellish really the same content and be working with the same content, uh, in many cases, real time as these tools evolve. And one of the things uh, I had the, uh, the uh, privilege to uh, work in, in with a team that developed the US National BIM standard back in 2012, version three, and uh, I was part of a team called the Market Education Team Work Group. And what we saw is one of the biggest challenges to BIM, if you will, implementation, the acronym BIM is Building Information Modeling, was real digital content. Um, and, and you'll see why in just just a couple of minutes here. Um, but it, we saw that as a, as a real challenge, a real impediment to that happening. In the past, when we had those silos, um, we used drawings. That was our, our tool of communication. And in, in, a, in a drawing, um, the most important aspect of a drawing was interpretation because you have different views. You have maybe a, uh, a floor plan as in the, on the slide here now, or elevations or other details and and they may or may not have all been in sync even uh, through revisions through the design development process uh different pieces and parts were really in different places and maybe or maybe not got updated uh, synchronously so uh often the same challenge was that with the, in, the interpretation uh you know, a lot of people say, what's wrong with my, my PDF cut sheets and, and drawing details? It, it gives everyone all the information. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, it actually does. But it has to, it again, it has to be interpreted. Uh, as the icons on the right show, Lawrence and I could be sitting at the exact same table, looking at the exact same sheet in the exact same set of drawings that were printed at the exact same time and come up with a totally different interpretation of what we think those drawings are telling us. Because it is it's kind of like another language. It's codes and symbols. Uh, when I say codes, it's 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 uh, ways that we set up schedules. We set up hatch marks. We ha we set all this up. When, when, once it goes to digitalization, it, it it's it's a game changer. No longer is there really any interpretation because we have technology tools that allow us. So at this point, in data we trust, and the differentiation between data and drawings or or data and and plans is that there is no interpretation. Data is, is straightforward. It's ones or, or zeros. It's black or white, yes or no. Um, and in, in, in the same sense, with the multiple technology tools uh, available to all of the community of, of, of people in the full building life cycle, being uh, designers, architects, engineers, construction managers, tradespeople, building owners, building facility managers, um, they're all able to, to interact with the exact same digital content, but they're using different tools. So uh, BIM is not software. Uh, BIM is a process. Uh, there are tools that um, are used to author BIM content, and that could be a, a what we used to call a CAD or a modeling package. That could even be other um, communication features that wrap around a, a model to help uh, manage the communication and, and the versioning and so forth of that content. Another key element that's a differentiator from plans is now we have data connected to real content. So not only do we have that 2D drawing if, if you need it, because you know we are in a transition in the industry, we also have the 3D geometry, and that's that's really cool. But now we, we have all of the the product information that allows us to uh, even in engineering do actual real virtualizations, uh, how's that for a, a, a contradiction, a real virtualization of a facility uh, to, to, to vet out the, um, the design, you know, whether it be engineering design of airflow or whatever. And, and speaking of that, there's a number of tools that are being used today. We actually here at BIM Object get uh, calls. I've received a lot of these of late from the likes of, in this case, it was SimScale um, out of Munich, Germany. They, they have a cloud platform for uh, what they call computational fluid dynamics. So they, they can design 
uh, buildings and, and do sun studies and look at air flows with specific air handlers, specific brands, uh, look at energy utilization based on different uh, uh, curtain wall systems, uh, different building loading, uh, different lighting. Uh, these all impact uh, the design and allow it to be designed uh, to emulate what it's really going to be as it's built. And even in the future, as we move forward, the same content that, that is going to be created, you know, whether you're using BIMScript or, or, or whatever you're using as a real building product manufacturer, that content lives through that full life of that building. And it might be 20 years in the case of university, it could be 50 or 100 years. So that, that your content or the building product manufacturer's content is part of that. I like to call it a living, breathing, organic, dynamic model that uh, is a digital twin emulating the actual facility. So you're part of the new built world order. Uh, as I mentioned, Legos, they all have to fit together. They're very simple and they do fit together. And um, I think many of us, uh, I worked in a, in a firm for a number of years. Um, you know, I also have been in the field and, and, and the challenge there is when it gets to the field, no matter how it was designed, no matter what was drawn, no matter what was specified, it has to fit together and function to performance specifications. And which is basically the owner's needs. And Legos are the same way. They all fit together. They all function. So with digital content, that's what we're trying to provide. And we are providing as the world's largest digital content provider for building products. We're providing a place that that content can be managed by the building product manufacturers, accessed by every person within the building uh, life cycle and leveraged and used throughout. So that's just a, a little bit of an overview of why it is so important, this whole concept of content and digital content. And the other challenge we have as, as leading the change in the world globally, as BIM Object is with our platform, uh, scaling. Uh, there's an immense, a monstrous, an immense amount of, of content that is still relegated to PDF cut sheets and maybe even drawings in manufacturers' uh, uh, operations. So with, with BIMScript, we, we believe that there's a major, we know there's a huge business opportunity for you to be part of the change and, and content developers to be part of the change uh, because BIMScript is a scripting tool that allows that content to actually be output into numerous file formats. So that being said, let me introduce to you our expert uh, BIMScript global trainer, Lawrence Lamb. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence has a, a extensive background in dealing with content uh, from a number of different perspectives. Um, not not just the tool sets uh, and so forth. He's worked with numerous uh, building product manufacturers over the year, helping them bring their content to digital life. So with that, Lawrence, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, hopefully you guys can see my screen. Um, thank you for that awesome introduction. And uh, as Steve has mentioned, uh, my name is Lawrence, and I'm one of the global trainers for BIMScript. Uh, so, as Steve mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about manufacturer-specific objects, how BIMScript can help manufacturers, developers, and end users make a difference, what are the customizable possibilities, and why is the digital content so important in today's building industry? So, what are manufacturer-specific objects? Well, manufacturer-specific objects are digital objects that are created by or on behalf of the building manufacturer to represent the products are real products. So it's something that it's not just digital. It's not, it's not, um, it's, it's not fabricated. Like, like someone didn't make this up. It exists. You can go out and buy it. It has real characteristics. So we're talking about things like uh, color finishes, materials, uh, sizes, it has real metadata. So when Steve was talking about sim scale and uh, computational flow dynamics, you know, they the, these objects will have the metadata for airflow, air changes per hour, um, you know, of amount of fluid uh, plumbing fixture uses or passes through, things like that. Um, and it's real geometry. So it's not uh, an approximation of what an object looks like. It's dimensionally accurate. Um, so you can put it in your design, fits where it's supposed to go. All the connectors are in the correct spot so that you know that it doesn't interfere with other connections from other uh, products that you want to include into your project. And it has real value. So not only 
are you getting a geometrically accurate product into your model, but you're also getting accurate metadata. You're not hunting and, and looking in the spec sheets for, uh, for values that may not be included in the model. Everything is there. Uh, so it provides value in that sense, and it allows multiple disciplines to coordinate at the same time because all the data for every discipline can be located within that model. So BIMScript helps expose uh, the digital building products to a larger segment of software that's used in the BIM projects today. And the way it does that is it actually creates multiple file formats from one source file. So if a building product manufacturer wanted to um, create a air handler using BIMScript, they would create it in one source software. So in our case, using BIMScript, you would use Rhinoceros. You create the model in Rhinoceros. You enter in all the parametric data that you want to include in there, um, all the options that the, that the model may have, and you send it out to our cloud environment, and it will generate up to nine, currently up to nine different file formats, right? And what, that, what that means is you can reach a larger audience because you're giving multiple, so, uh, multiple file formats of the same object. So a person who's using SketchUp versus a person who's using Revit of that product will still be accessing the same data because it comes from the same source file. So as mentioned, modeling software is only one of the numerous uh, digital tools used in the building industry, but all buildings are designed teams using different software for design. Uh, they have they use different software for engineering and procurement and construction, commissioning, facility management. And this is where BIMScript allows you to reach everybody within that audience. As mentioned earlier, we have the software is able to output multiple file formats. So if you're uh, facility management um, and you need, let's say you just want 2D CAD that's fine, you have that information. If you need 3D BIM for a digital twin for your building, you have that information. If you want information for procurement, the information will be within those models. Who do you gotta get it from? How much does it cost? Things like that. Um, and then lead time. So they can integrate all of that information right into the model. So how does this benefit everybody? Hey, well, for the building product, Yep. Right. Excuse yes, me. We got a couple of questions. I think that that fit in real well here. Actually, two different ones. Um, uh, uh, Anton Daskovich and Peter Cucci. Um, the, the question is: is uh, how do how does it how does the process get handled when uh, products are maybe changed after tendering or you know after procurement? Um, and what happens when there's a product substitution during the course of, of the job? Um, this is part of what's changing. This is the shift in in, in the industry. Uh, what what happens is what what we're doing this earlier in the process. Uh, so the the products are being defined earlier in the process in many cases, and um, sometimes even by serial owners uh, up front. So the, the bottom line is is that you swap out the digital content. You know, if X Y Z brand of flush valve was specified and and in and then it got for whatever reason, you were able to get an approved equal for ABC brand of flush valve, those actually would be swapped out in the model as well. So it, this actually is part of the workflow. Uh, you know, what, what Lawrence here is building with his, his content is these products interchange because that's what happens in real life. If you're gonna change these out, they have to fit, they have to work back to the Lego concept. So hopefully that answers those, those two points or questions. Yeah. That's awesome, Steve. Thanks for answering that. And just to build up on that, because you have the manufacturer specific model in your design and you're doing it using the BIM process, you know where all the connections are going to be and so on and so forth. So if with that information, even if you're going to be changing out a product, again, you're going to be addressing that issue earlier on in the design phase. Um, and you can find, it's easier to find products that will fit that exact size and location and things like that because you're not using a generic model anymore. You're not just using a placeholder. You're using 
something that's manufacturer specific. So if an air handler has the you know the in the input connection at the top of the unit and then the exhaust on the bottom, well then you have to find a unit to match that. You just can't find something that's similar but with a you know with the input and output flipped because now it messes up the whole design. So it gives you those kinds of specifics that that will allow you to look for a appropriate substitute. And again, that gets handled early on in the design phase. So it's not it's not eliminating it. You're just moving it from one. You're moving it from the end of the design phase to more towards you know the the middle. Oh, Lawrence, this is exactly um, another question we have here. Exactly touches on what you were talking about, and and I get this a lot. Um, most government contracts, uh, Dave Edwards suggested that they don't allow manufacturer content. Uh, they don't allow manufacturer specific content. Well, a couple of things that we're seeing happen in the industry, uh, and this is a great question, um, because truly uh, all over the world, uh, a lot of places, any anything that is government funded, they can't uh, demand a single brand. What um, uh, is being utilized is a concept called requirement objects, which also can be created with BIM script. But essentially the requirement objects have all the metadata that Lawrence has been talking about also in, that is fulfilled just like um, in, in many specifications, uh, they're, they're, you're given two or three brands um, with the or equal. But the key is, is that it has to perform to those levels. Um, there is a, a, a number of what I call serial owners, which would be universities, would be retail store chains, hotel chains. Um, many of them are, um, though they're not government entities, they are requiring uh, similar things. They're, 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 they're requiring a certain set of, of actual content to be used. But in the government, cases, um, the requirement objects are kind of like unbranded specific content. So it does have the performance information necessary uh, to to uh, satisfy those needs. And one of the questions about this, they said, well, what happens when it gets changed out and, and, it's, and it's later in the process? Well, this it's it's hopefully by using these tools like we, we spoke of earlier, the, the, the CFD, the computational fluid dynamics and virtualizations, you're able to make sure what works earlier. And if it's a price issue, we still have a, a, the change process that doesn't change at all. Just like in the field, you have to adapt and maybe have a different rough end for a different flush valve. The same communication process has to take place. But part of that is instead of the drawings get updated, which is usually two weeks after the fact, too late, um, the real time digital model is gonna get updated. Okay. Um... All right, let's move on. So how does it benefit everyone? So let's go through the, how it benefits the manufacturer. So for the manufacturer, uh, the products get exposed to a greater market based on the larger number of file formats that BIMSCAM can create. Um, and these objects will, since it has a realistic representation, um, it provides the end user with the look and feel of that product, as well as including all the performance characteristics of uh, of that product, so they can run their simulations or cost analysis, uh, building performance, and things like that. For the end user, again, you get a real look, realistic looking piece of content that you can use within your design, and you have all the digital metadata available to you within the click of a mouse. And it's not just the metadata, but it's also information that goes maybe outside of uh, what you want to see in a model. So uh, warranty inf links to warranty information, um, a parts list, things like that. You can build that information, those links to direct the end user to going to get that information um, outside of the model. But that the, the, the link is there to connect that product to the manufacturer. Hey, Lawrence, uh, this is, uh, so Catherine Christensen just you know, asked a little bit ago, does uh, Rhino include metadata? Obviously, she knows that um, BIMScript is a plug-in for Rhino. You want to talk about that a little bit and about how we externalize some of that, that metadata as property sets? Right. So uh, Rhino itself doesn't con uh, doesn't include any of the metadata. Um, Rhino is a, um, it is considered a BIM uh, model and creation tool. So you would create the models within Rhino, we use that as a basis to create the file, uh, the geometry and things like that. 
And then we use BIM script to script in all the parametrics. So if it has size changes, uh, color differentiation, uh, material changes, and if you have um, options that can or cannot or can be included with a product or you can, you know, you can disassociate uh, an option or include it, you can use BIM script to include all of those options. Now, uh, what Steve was talking about was, you know, uh, to compartmentalize the, the property sets. At BIM Object, we have, uh, on our portal, we have the product page for, for the manufacturer's product. And these BIM script files or the Rhino file is actually linked to that product page. So if you were to go into BIMobject.com, you would go and look for an air handler. You find the one that you want from a certain manufacturer. And that product page would contain information about, you know, the description of this product, where the product is made available, um, and, you know, the files are available for download, but it also has property sets. So the property sets are part of the product page. And at BIM Object, we also create apps that, would, that you can get for SketchUp, for Revit, for Archicad, that will pull the property sets, the metadata from the product page into the model when you're ready for it. And you can pull down whichever property set you want as long as it's available into your model. So when you, when you develop the model, you're developing a lightweight model that doesn't have all the information built into it because you may not need at the, at, you know, at the design, early design phase, you might not need all that metadata. It weighs the model down a bit, um, not extremely heavy, but it does add size to the model. And you might not need it at that time. You don't, maybe you don't care about the airflow at the time. You just need to make sure that the connections work and that you can fit it on the roof. Um, and then once you get past that early conceptual design phase, now you need to get data. So what you could do is you could use the app and uh, within Revit, for example, and you can fetch the products, uh, the property set for, for that product and then push that property set into the model. So now it becomes part of your model within Revit. It wasn't part of it before when you downloaded it, but the app will actually grab that property set as part of the that's part of the property or that's part of the product page and push it towards the model into the model that it now becomes part of Revit that you can use that information. The nice thing about this is if a manufacturer changes or updates some of the properties, they have the ability to go in and manage that property set on their own. So the property set is actually managed by the manufacturer and, be, and can be updated as many times as they want. And it doesn't impact the end user, meaning that they don't have to go and download a new file or get notified that a new file is ready every single time. So if you download a file six months ago and you put it in your project and within, uh, you know, with, you know, within that time, from the time that you downloaded it to the time you used it, the manufacturer made an update. Well, it doesn't mean that you have to go and download a new model. You just have to push up, just push the new updates of the metadata from the product page into the new model or into Lawrence, the current model that you have. Yes. That's a great explanation. One of the uh, property sets that we have in BIM objects that's standard that many people use and is used heavily uh, in UK, for instance, and all over for anything that's uh, government based for the most part is Kobe data. Kobe data can be included with every single product page. Now, uh, it's up to the building product manufacturer to decide if they're going to furnish that or not. They are actually furnishing it in the old school method of PDFs. It has to be there. They couldn't sell the products without it. But with a property set, all that information is immediately available as data. And and actually, there you know we have the capability as the as you folks as users and and industry um, ask for it of of other. Uh, uh, you know, Infocom and, and some of these other, uh, uh, you know, even NEMA or, or any other standard property sets that you're finding that are repeated um, or as well as a manufacturer, a building product manufacturer can actually have their own created uh, as well. So anyway, just, just to go a little further and give you a succinct example, a lot of people I'm, I know are familiar with Kobe data. And, and right. that, that plugin so, is also available for Vectorworks and AutoCAD as well as uh, Revit, SketchUp and ArchiCAD. Exactly. Thank you, Steve. So, um, Catherine, I hope that answers your question in regards to the metadata. Um, so, back to uh, the topic. So, how else does the uh, manufacturer content or using BIM script to, to develop manufacturer content, how does that help the content developer? Well, 
you get to work on uh, real life products, which is always exciting. And we always encourage our uh, accredited BIM script developers to reach out to uh, the building product manufacturers, whether they're big or small, to get them involved within the BIM process and get them into the BIM ecosystem so that their products are not just, you know, flat 2D drawings, it provides value for their end user. And it's not limited to big manufacturers. It's for everyone, for any any manufacturer out there, you know, the more content that's made available, uh, the better it is for all the designers and facility managers um, to get accurate data uh, for real life products. And you also get a chance to create quality products which define the product uh, for that manufacturer. So overall, the, the benefits can help cut costs due to you know, better, um, uh, better collaboration and coordination. Um, you don't have to, you can reach more end users um, through using or through creating multiple file formats using one source. So you don't have to you know, do the investing in multiple uh, programs to create one file for each uh, program natively. Um, and overall, uh, it should streamline the, the building process. Or the Lawrence, I, I, I hate to keep interrupting you. We got this is great though. We got a lot of good questions coming in. They're they're right on point with what you're talking about. So the question that Peter Rise asked, uh, and it's similar to Adam Ridge, uh, how many import export formats are there? Uh, their output. Um, they say for Rhino to use, but actually Rhino outputs them. Uh, can you can you run down through those? And and tagging on with that, uh, can BIM script be used by a design firm that needs to work with many different file types and formats? That's, but you're so, not selling a product. So let's uh, let's go through the first part. So what what can Rhino take? What can Rhino take in as an input? So Rhino, we use Rhino because it has the greatest, um, I guess, it has the biggest list of uh, importable importable file formats. So if you're working, if you're dealing with a manufacturer or you are a manufacturer that uses um, SolidWorks or Inventor or um, any other kind of production style CAD software to design your product, you can ex we can use those files within Rhino. So step files, SOLIDWORKS files, all those files, they can be imported. And once it's imported, you can just clean it up and you have a base set of geometry where you use BIM script to program in all the parametrics. Now, um, in terms of what it exports, so the export list would include DWGs, 2D and 3D, uh, Revit, SketchUp, FBX, OBJ, STL. Um, am I missing any? Um, 3DS and F FBX. Maybe. Yeah, and yeah. So it does. It should. If I missed a couple, um, I apologize. It's all on our website on bimscript.bimobject.com. Uh, but we can get fi nine file formats. So you can, we have file formats that will support AR and VR, uh, um, uh, rapid prototyping for printing using the STL format, uh, Vectorworks and AutoCAD uh, will use the DWG. We got OBJ and 3DS that can be used in 3D renderings. Uh, we got Revit, SketchUp and ArchiCAD as well. So those are the output file formats. But in terms of input file formats, the list is actually larger than that because we can accept a lot of the the uh, the bigger uh, uh, manufacturing kind of CAD CAM software uh, files. So moving forward, we're going to take a look at what the life cycle um, of a manufacturer specific object is from conception at the manufacturers through BIM script to facility management. So the product gets designed through the by the building product manufacturer. They give that content to an accredited BIM script developer or to BIM object to create content for using BIM script because they want to make that product uh, accessible to uh, BIM projects. Once the BIM script file or Rhino file is ready, it gets uploaded and exposed on the to the public on the BIM object portal. So that's really important to note that like I mentioned before, the BIM script file or uh, the BIM script generated file is actually linked 
to a product page that's specific on the BIM object website. So the manufacturer has control over the product pages and the models, and the model can get data from the product page that it's associated to. Um, and that all of that information as a bundle can go out to the to the end user. So if they want to get a model, that's where they get one. If they want to get additional properties or they just want to know about the product, they can still get that information from the same plot, from the same space. Um, once the object gets downloaded by the end user, it's used in the project or it uses that product for design and it contains real geometry so that if you want to do uh, rendering or virtualization, you can do that to show to the, the customer, the client, the building owner, whoever you need to show it to. Okay, upon implementing it in the plans, the engineers can run simulations based on the metadata that's contained within the model. So um, back to the point where you may not need the data up front because you're only doing conceptual design, uh, you don't have to push that metadata in. But when you get to this point where you want to start running simulations, you got to put together a schedule, um, all that kind of stuff for finalizing or you know uh, advanced stages of design, you can now use the apps within those various BIM softwares that we've developed for and push the metadata from the product page on demand to the, to the, um, to the model itself. So then you have it within your design. Lawrence, on, on this, uh, we've had a couple, uh, couple questions or uh, points. Uh, one of the concerns was, um, let me see uh, who, how they said this. Uh, basically, they want to know what happens then when a product is updated by a manufacturer on our portal. Does it swap out the model? Um, no, it doesn't. What it does do, though, is it will flag the, the next person that opens that model up if it's six months or six years down the road. Uh, because of the call to home function, which is the only reason you need to register on, on BIMobject.com to download, because of that, it says, hey, there is a new version of this same product available. You know, maybe building codes changed and, and the manufacturer had to change some parameter or, or add another ASTM qualification or something like this, That, but they didn't really change the whole product out. Um, it'll notify you and it, it notifies you, do you want to download the new version or not? So it's not one of the other earlier concerns someone voiced, and I'm sorry I can't see it in the list of questions right now, was does this mean my model is always going to be changing with updates? Uh, no, it's it's up to you to control, uh, and but but you do get notified. Right, and it doesn't version. change a model. Like I said, um, like I mentioned earlier, if you downloaded a model six months ago and they made changes between the time that you downloaded the model and uh, when you use it, and the manufacturer made some updates on the product page. If it's if it's metadata changes, you don't need to download a new model for it. The only time you need to actually download a new model is if the product actually changes. So if it physically changes, then there will probably be a new model out. And manufacturers are, are pretty good at, uh, um, they have the tools on our site to notify, to find out who's downloaded that content. They can notify that person and say, hey, look, you know, you've downloaded an older model. We got a new release out. Here's a new product that replaces that. So, you know, uh, Manufacturers can also reach out to the to the person who uh, downloaded it and give them a heads up um, as to what changed. And then you have the and then as an end user, you have the ability to either accept the change or or not change your model, right? If you don't want to update it, like Steve said, you don't have to update it. Um, it's that's part of the manual process, uh, but um, it will it will tell you when you when there are changes involved or when uh, when there are changes available. Um, so during the construction process for a manufacturer specific object, it's easy for you to keep track of the project uh, because of the instructions that's included within the model about the products, uh, the placement in the drawings, how it's going to be placed, um, where the MEP connectors are. So it's not a guessing game as to if the connections are coming through the back or the side or whatever. So um, even minor things like um, maybe small electrical connectors and things like that, you can see where everything goes. Uh, so it's easier for coordination, it's easier to keep track of the project, um, so easier in, in overall during the construction phase. But the most important thing is that the, the BIM model, the digital twin for this, pro, for this building doesn't die after the construction process is over. When the construction process is over, this, this digital building that has just been created still lives on 
and can be used for facility management. Um, at this point, you know where everything is. The, the facility manager knows where all the products are, which room they're in, they know how high it is, they know where they got installed. And if anything were to happen that needs maintenance, they have the information at their fingertip. What is this product? What is the model number? Can I still get it? Who is the manufacturer? You know, um, are, is there is there a link to you know a parts list, all that kind of stuff, and it's all within this model, and it's and they can all access it. So, if you work in a building that's maybe 60 years old from now, you don't have to worry about a product getting discontinued and having to look for um, a replacement object. Uh, but before you can do that, you need to know the specs and all that kind of stuff. And 60 years from now, or 10 years from now. Uh, 60 years might be an exaggeration, but 10 years from now, you may not find that document anymore. It may be discontinued. You may have to sit there and Google it for like half a day. But with the digital twin, that information is there. It's always there and it won't change. And if they do make a change to the product at that time, if you can't find a new one and uh, you know it gets replaced, you always have the ability to go back into the digital model and then update it with the new product that you just replaced it with. So you can keep that digital twin as updated uh, as possible to match the real life building that you're in. So with that said, I'll uh, let Steve talk about what's gonna go yeah. on um, now that we're, we've gone so through we got, all the meat. Of the excellent, we've got a couple other questions that apply here and this is the perfect place for them. Um, uh, so now what this gives you an overview write these down that's uh the the vimscript.bimobject.com you can find all the information out about vimscript um the team you can reach us uh lawrence myself uh, peter mate uh also one of our other global trainers at vimscript.bimobject.com um after we're done there'll be a real short survey and really it's just one question what else can can we help with what else do you want to hear about uh and one other question we have is are you planning to give a live presentation of the BIM script at any time soon? Uh, so every month we hold uh, uh, on the um, second Wednesday of the month on our webinar Wednesday, and it's coming up on May 8th, learn how to become an accredited BIM script content developer. So that that's runs every month. And then between those, on, on as this one is, on the fourth Wednesday of the month, we, we are running a topical, uh, a topical webinar, and those are largely driven by what you're asking us. What, what do you want to know more about? And part of one other question we have from Donna Tabor Hansen, uh, Lawrence, I'm going to let you answer this quickly because we're almost out of time. But uh, what is an accredited BIM script developer? You want to give that quick overview and how to, how to go about having that happen? Sure. So a BIM, an accredited BIM script developer would be somebody who's gone through the online or on-site accreditation course. So we do, um, there's an online accreditation course that you can, uh, that you can contact us to get registered for at any time. And then there's an on-site accreditation course where that's pretty, that's more of an on-demand uh, type class depending on, um, you know, uh, level of interest within a certain area. Uh, uh, if you work for a manufacturer, then we do uh, come out to the manufacturer uh, to do a uh, BIM script training session, it's about two or three days um, for that. Uh, so there are, but what it means is, is that once you've gone through the accreditation class, it means that you understand how the how the BIM script or how the BIM object ecosystem works in regards to BIM script, how to create BIM script content, um, how to generate the files, and then you're given access once you've passed the accreditation. You've now you're now given access with your account to go in and start creating BIM script content and. Um, and helping manufacturers create content to publish it within our site, uh, on our site. Um, so if you were to, if you wanted to just try it out, there's nothing to stop you from trying it out. Uh, BIMScript is free for everybody. The BIMScript accreditation is actually free for everyone. So if you, all you got to do is just register on BIMobject.com, uh, contact uh, Steve or myself or Peter through BIMScript at BIMobject.com through that email. Tell us that you want to get uh, accredited, we can set you up with the online accreditation where you got to go to get the information. There's a couple of uh, lessons, short lessons that you can go through to show you how to do 
create basic content and then how to use the advanced features of BIMScript. Um, and then it gives you access to our training brand where you can practice creating product pages and um, and then uploading your your finalized or your final finally created BIMScript models up to that site. And then you can download them to see how they work in Revit, how they work in SketchUp and so on and so forth. Um, so if you're an accredited developer, you get the access to our portal in our training area. If you just want to try it out, you're not sure whether you want to be accredited or not, but you, you're interested in BIMScript, you can always download it for free. Uh, Rhino, from what I understand, has uh, a 60 day uh, trial that you can download for free. You can get Rhino 6 for free for 60 days and then download BIMScript. That's absolutely free for you for lifetime. And then try it out. The only thing that you won't be able to do is upload any of the finished products to our site. But there is a preview window that will still allow you to preview what the file would look like with all the different uh, parametric parameters and user configurable options and things like that that you that you program into excuse me that you programmed into your model. Um, so if you're interested in becoming an accredited developer and you want to try to um, publish some content and get the accreditation title if you want to put it to your name and then sell yourself if you're a content creator if you want to go and reach out to building product manufacturers and say I'm you know I'm a I'm an accredited BIM script developer I can help you build develop BIM content um, uh, through the BIM object uh, ecosystem you can do that right because yeah. you're you're now accredited and we'll we help you out with that so one way we can help you get that word out is uh, if you see on the screen right now the the LinkedIn uh, BIM, our BIM script page on LinkedIn, you're able now, the way that page is set up, to add that either to your um, to your training or, or education um, as as if you or or as a company. Uh, so you can list those in in your profile on LinkedIn, um, and it'll tell you back to the BIM script uh, page for as as a company. That that may be helpful because we are now sending manufacturers out there to go look at the BIM script uh, LinkedIn page to find accredited developers as they as they come online. Um, the the uh, on-site academies, as Lawrence mentioned, are, are usually, um, those are individually quoted. They're usually for a building product manufacturer or another training center. And, and again, contact us directly for, for any of any of those. Um, one other, a couple other questions that we had there, maybe not so much BIM script related, but it, it applies to the BIM object. Uh, Alfredo Gomez asked uh, about uh, translated objects to be uploaded to the BIM object site. Uh, BIM object supports 22 different languages for every product. Now that uh, it, it doesn't do any kind of auto translate, but that's available when and, and you would learn about that as an, becoming an accredited developer, how to manage building those product pages with uh, all, all of the various. But again, this is up to the building product manufacturer to decide. Um, just as there's one other one, um, it says, oh, I've noticed in BIM object from Darlene uh, Reimer that, that some manufacturers don't offer um, certain file types. We we recommend and and often this is uh, maybe pre BIM script uh, content. Uh, other manufacturers might have had content already and and they didn't redevelop it or build it new for the BIM object portal using BIM script. Had they done that, they would have the multiple file formats, which would include ArchiCAD and SketchUp VectorWorks, as Lawrence pointed out. So we encourage it. Um, we try to help the manufacturers understand how important that is to the larger community that they offer their content in numerous uh, software platform file formats for for consumption, you know, for content consumers. Um, I think But if there is a, if there, sorry to interrupt, but if there is a file format that you are looking for on our site that uh, doesn't exist for a manufacturer, there is a request uh, file type or request file um, button within that product page and it will actually notify, uh, it'll send an email out to the manufacturer, um, letting them know that you are looking for a specific file type. So, um, great if you, reminder. If, if, if enough people, <laughs> if enough people request a certain file type, that will that will start changing the manufacturer's mind on how many people actually use uh, certain BIM software because sometimes they have a, uh, they they think that one particular software is being used more than others uh, and it might have been true maybe years ago but as you know software changes people adapt new software so they might not be aware that let's say the ArchiCAD format is more important than they, than they actually think so if you if enough requests 
go into go to this manufacturer um it it'll shift it, it'll hopefully change their minds into uh developing uh multiple file formats so that more people can can take advantage of that like yourself and coupling on with that there's another button called missing manufacturer button so Ma manuel murillo asked uh he works in the fire protection industry and he can't find uh, many manufacturer objects do you see any improvements on this issue in the future there are two ways that you can do this you as what we call the content consumer one is the Vincent manufacturer button that that actually uh will cause bim object wherever they, we are on the planet one of our people will be contacting that manufacturer to express to them that you a content consumer whatever your role is are, are looking for their content they're looking for their products on our portal so that's one way the other way is uh, many design firms is when i worked in them you know lunch and learns were were always the the way to go uh because if i went and listened to somebody's um, uh, product uh education format for 45 minutes i got a free lunch and 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 i learned a lot so the best thing to do is is the first thing you do is raise your hand are you on bim object and and, and help these manufacturers understand how important it is that they have a digital content initiative and they understand that that you the the content consumer again whatever whether you're in a design firm a a, a trade partner uh facility management whatever it is get that um help them understand that that you this is what you're looking for um, I'm going to throw up a, a, a poll real quick here. One last one um, that uh, just ask, uh, were you aware uh, of the BIM script and its power before today's discussion as we wrap up? Uh, one other question that Roberto uh, Sosa had, I uh, hope you can share the webinar rec recording via email. Yes, uh, Roberto, we will be. It usually follows up within a day or two after, or two days after you'll get an email with a link in there. And you'll be able to share that with uh, your colleagues or, or anyone else or listen to it again on your own. So with that, the, remember, once again, as soon as we close out, you will have a, a brief chance to enter uh, what your topics are on our survey that you would like to see us uh, talk about in the future as with, with upcoming webinars. We have we plan to add more, more than just the second and fourth Wednesdays of each month. Uh, we have at least two more Wednesdays and we can always go to Tuesdays and Thursdays. So. Uh, please let us know what you're looking for and we'll, we'll deliver the content for sure for you. We really appreciate everyone uh, staying with us today for taking time out of your day. We're, we're all, you're all busy and, and have a lot to do. So thank you for understanding that, that we think this is really important and hopefully we've given you some good value. And if not, please let us know what we can do to make it better. Um, with that being said, I think we're ready to sign off. Well, Lawrence, do you have any, uh, any closing remarks? No, I just want to thank everybody for their time. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been great speaking to everyone today. Uh, the questions were great, so uh, we appreciate all the questions. Keep them coming. If there's anything that you uh, that you think of later that you couldn't think of during this webinar, um, then please feel free to contact us and we'll help you out as best as we can. And we'll try to answer your questions as promptly as, as possible. Yep. BIMScript at BIMOptic.com. With that, we'll see you again real soon next webinar. Thanks again. Have a great week. Bye-bye.